without one plea, but that Thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou bidst me come to Thee.
Good evening and welcome again to the Bible study here at Grange Baptist Church. And we're thankful for your willingness to join with us even as we come together this evening. And as we do so, we are of course coming to our regular prayer meeting and Bible study. And thus after the message tonight, we are encouraging our own church folk to spend that time in prayer as we come together around the throne of grace. Just to give you a little insight into the program for the rest of the week, uh, tomorrow evening we'll have a Bible study again, but uh, of course at the later time of 8.15. And so we're meeting together tomorrow night at 8.15. That'll be the last broadcast then before the Sabbath day, uh, just due to the bank holiday weekend. And thus we'll meet together in the will of the Lord on the Lord's Day, is Sunday at 12 noon. We're coming this evening to Nehemiah in chapter 11. Nehemiah in chapter 11. Let's read together the first two verses of the chapter and then we'll give ourselves to the consideration of these things. The Bible says, And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Amen. And may the Lord bless even the reading of his word again to our hearts. It was the 4th of August, 1914, that Field Marshal, Field Marshal Lord Kitchener knew what it was to be appointed Secretary of State for War. This is, of course, in the immediate aftermath of Britain declaring war on Germany. And thus, as he took up the post on the 5th of August, he immediately set about seeking to recruit new volunteers even to the army and its wider support services. He recognized and identified that a war campaign would involve a much strategic planning. And there was a great need then for many more people to be engaged even in the effort to defend Britain. Between the beginning of the month of August and then the end of September, over half a million people signed up to volunteer their services to their country. And forever and a day, there will be that record, of course, of the great poster that he prepared and was prepared for that occasion, of the finger outstretched and those words, your country needs you. It's my belief that that poster should adorn the entrance hall to every church. For as we come to the word of God tonight, I want you to understand something simple. Your church needs you. The work of God needs you. I know that we would lift up our eyes and behold the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Remember, as we come into this 11th chapter, we are continuing to read of days of revival here in the times of Nehemiah, days in which the Spirit of God is evidently moving amongst the people. Days in which the Word of God is central, even as that Word is being preached, proclaimed, read, and applied. We've noted, of course, this week in our studies, how that that drove the people to their knees. And they exhibit to us what it means to pray in a revival way. They counted their blessings. They confessed their sins. And then they consecrated themselves afresh to God and to His work. And therefore, as we come into chapter 11, it's no surprise that we find here a record of those who were willingly engaged in the service of God. And all of this was outplayed even in their willingness to respond to that call that went forth, that call to serve. Jerusalem was a largely unpopulated city at this point. Remember, the work had been accomplished in rebuilding the walls and setting upon the gates again and allowing that city to function and to prosper just as God desired it to. But as that city was being rebuilt, there was, of course, the glaringly obvious concern that not many people dwelt therein. The people who had been in the land of Judah prior to Ezra, prior to even Nehemiah coming, had settled in rural locations. They didn't settle in the urban structure of the city. Remember, the city was just a pile, really, of debris, dust, and rubble. And therefore, as the walls were rebuilt, and as the gates were rehung, and there was that desire to see Jerusalem hustle and bustle again, there was a requirement then for many people to be engaged in living in the city, working in the city, and indeed getting the city going again. And thus, as the servant of God surveyed the needs, we understand that this call to serve went out. And therefore, we want to learn some uh, uh, lessons simply from the Word of God tonight as we come to this message. And we're simply calling this message, The Work of God Needs You. 
For in this chapter, I believe we can learn much about what it means to be involved in the work of God and why indeed we all should be involved in the work of God. And as we survey the lives of the children of Judah in the days of Nehemiah, they set out, they lay out for us some clear examples that we do well to follow. I want us to notice, first of all, the type of work that needs to be done. The type of work that needs to be done. As the call went out, it was, of course, to meet specific needs. It was to meet specific identifiable needs that were existent in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah and the other leaders knew that the raising up of workers to fulfill the rules that existed was crucial. If the burden to see uh, Jerusalem thrive and prosper once again was ever to be realized. And thus as they looked around the city, and thus as they uh, indeed surveyed the needs of the city, they have compiled this list of identifiable rules that needed to be filled. Now come back a couple of chapters to chapter 7. Nehemiah in chapter 7, and we see that this was always in the heart of Nehemiah. For it tells us there in chapter 7 and the verse 3 that Nehemiah said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot, and while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them, and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, every one in his watch, and every one to be over against his house. Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not builded. And so this was something that was already in the heart of Nehemiah many days before this call to serve went out. It was something he was thinking about. It was plans that he was laying down, making preparation for rules to be fulfilled as he identified them. And even back there in chapter 7, he identified that there was need for watchers. There was identified, uh, they identified the need even for gatekeepers, those who would open and the gates of the city and close them at night and allow the city to function as it should. I come across to chapter 10. And this is where we've been dwelling upon in the last two evenings in our Bible study. This consecrating afresh of the people, their lives unto God. But within this, they themselves identified rules that needed to be filled. If that consecration was to be truly realized and enacted, even as they desired it to be. And I come with me even uh, to... The verse 33 and the verse 34 of chapter 10, and it tells us there, For the showbread, for the continual meat offering, and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, for the set feasts, and for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel, and for all the work of the house of our God. And we cast the lots and the, among the priests, the Levites, and the people for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God after the houses of our fathers at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And remember, this was the people separating themselves as they consecrated their lives afresh to God. They were separating themselves unto the true worship of God, desiring to fulfill the law and its obligations that it placed upon them. The sacrificial system that they were under, they sought it to be played out and they sought it to be carried out even as God had instituted. And therefore, people, there was required for people to be involved in the bringing of the wood bringing up the sacrifices so that continually uh, this sacrificial system could be uh, functioning even there within the temple, within the city of Jerusalem. And so they themselves had identified rules that needed to be filled, this continual bringing of what was required for sacrifices to be offered day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year in the temple. Now come into chapter 11 and we see very clearly evidence of rules being identified by the leaders and how that as the leaders surveyed Nehemiah and the others who helped him survey the city, they saw what was required if the city was to prosper and indeed was to be filled with that hustle and bustle once again, that hustle and bustle of urban life was to be realized there amongst the city walls. Come to verse 6. It tells us there, All the sons of Perez that dwelt at Jerusalem were four hundred, three score, and eight valiant men. Here was a requirement for those who would guard the city. And so there were soldiers, there was warriors required so that the city could be properly defended in the event of attack, so that the people within it could feel safe and business could be conducted even in a safe environment. So soldiers were required. 
Come down to verse 11. It says, Sariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Merioth, the son of Ahitub, was the ruler of the house of God. And so leadership within the house of God was required. Here was an identifiable rule. Leadership within the house of God. To carry on into verse 12, and it tells us their brethren that did the work of the house were 820 and 2. And Adaiah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Peliel, the son of Amzi, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pasher, the son of Malchiah. And here, identified within verse 12, was a whole squad of people that were required to work in the temple of God. They were those who uh, had to work in maintaining the temple, cleaning it, and it, uh, to provide administration in the temple of God. And look, the Bible numbers them as 822. What a squad of people was required just to ensure that the temple could go about day by day fulfilling that which God desired. Come down to verse 16. And we see not only was there work within the temple, but there was work without the temple. It tells us there that Shabbatiah and Josabad, of the chief of the Levites, had the oversight of the outward business of the house of God. So these were the ground keepers. These were the people who pulled the weeds, watered the shrubs, cleaned the paths, ensured that the outside of the temple and its grounds were properly cared for, tended to and functioning, and indeed uh, were appealing even to the eye. It tells us in verse 17 that Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Sabdi, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving in prayer. Who was this? This was the prayer warriors, those who would pray and make worship unto the Lord by prayer, praying for the people, praying unto God for blessing upon the people, for preservation of the city and for the nation. These were the prayer warriors. Verse 19, it tells us there, moreover, the Porters, Akub, Talmon, and their brethren that kept the gates were in hundreds, seventy and two. Here were the doorkeepers, those who were responsible for ensuring that the gates of the city, the doors of the city, were open and shut at the appropriate times, allowing people to enter and leave just as they were just as they were desirous to, and allowing that business function of the city to go uh, on unhindered and to, indeed to thrive. These were the gatekeepers. Verse 22, we see another rule that they identified. It tells us there, the overseer also of the Levites at Jerusalem was Uzai, the son of Bani, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micah, the sons of Asaph. You'll remember the sons of Asaph, or indeed, you'll remember a psalm of Asaph. These were the singers in the temple. These were a people that were always identified with the singing of psalms, with the melodious worship of God. That song of thanksgiving, that song of praise, that song of repentance that was ushered forth. Remember, David indeed encouraged the people to sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving in their heart, to indeed make a joyful noise unto the Lord, to use the stringed instruments, to use the harps, to use the percussion instruments, to use the cymbals. All of these things were used in the melodious worship of God. And here was a rule identified within the city that needed to be filled. There had to be worship leaders. There had to be song leaders. And so as the leaders of the city, as they conduct this survey, Nehemiah and those who helped him as they surveyed what was required for the city to get up and going once again, they of course identified the key rules, but they also identified those that were crucial to maintaining a right and proper relationship to God. Now fast forward to the generation in which we live. And can you not see how easy it is to identify the needs within a local church? And how those are so similar to many of the needs that were existent in the days of Nehemiah? Does the church not know to know those within it who are willing to do that which is necessary to allow it to function as it should? Does the church not need those who are willing to defend it? Those who are willing to be leaders? Those who are willing to work in the manual tasks required inside and outside to ensure its propriety and ability to hold meetings? Does the church not need those who are prayer warriors praying for the preaching and the teaching of God's word, praying for the purity of the witness of the fellowship to be maintained, praying for the church to grow and to prosper as God intends it to? Does the church not need doorkeepers, those willing to be the face of the church? Does the church not need worship leaders, song leaders, musicians and singers, all who give their talents unceasingly to their church and do so in a way that promotes genuine true worship of God amongst the people of the church? 
The answer is, of course it does. So tonight, as we survey all that Nehemiah identified, and as we ourselves survey the needs of our church and the needs of many local churches, tell me what type of work do you do currently in your church? What type of work are you willing to do in your church? The hymn writer put it this way, There's a work for Jesus ready at your hand. Tis a task the Master just for you has planned. Haste to do his bidding, yield him service true. There's a work for Jesus none but you can do. Work for Jesus day by day, serve him ever, falter never, Christ obey. Yield him service loyal true. There's a work for Jesus none but you can do. Remember, your church needs you. Not only the type of work that uh, was needed to be done, but also, notice with me, secondly, the way the work was allocated. The way the work was allocated. We see here that when the work was identified, there were certain ways in which the workers were found to fulfill that work. Nehemiah, in verse 1, applies the principle of the tithe to this filling of the rules. And we see that his desire was that a tenth of the people would move from their rural homelands to the city. The Bible says the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the method that he used in uh, discerning which of the people would be amongst the, the tenth of the number of them that would find themselves moving to the city was, of course, the casting of the lot. Now, remember, this was a valid way that the children of Israel could discern the will of God, know the mind of God in certain matters. The book of Proverbs reminds us in chapter 16 and the verse 33 that the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And thus, when employing this method, the people were seeking the mind of God, and rightfully so. This was crucial if the blessing of God was to be known. They must know what it was to choose the right people, to fill these rules, to move to the city. It was wrong, and it would be wrong of them to encourage the wrong people. How devastating it would have been to the whole project if the wrong people had been involved in the long rules, or the wrong people had been encouraged to be at the forefront of their efforts to please God. And so they sought God's will. Now, this is a principle that is, of course, still enacted in in any New Testament local church today. The lot is no longer a valid method of seeking direction from God because the believer has within us the Holy Spirit of God. You and I have the Holy Spirit of God who has covenanted to lead us and to guide us into all truth. And therefore, whenever we face situations where the will of God, the mind of God is what we seek and what we seek to be known amongst us, then we must come to the Word of God and seek guidance from the Word of God. And we must pray over that which the Word of God speaks to us. And thus we can know rightly and uh, uh, obtain rightly the wisdom that God promises to give unto all those who ask. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And you're facing a, 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 a question that you have to answer. You're facing a choice you have to make. You always must remember to allow that choice, to allow that answer to be guided by God himself. Allow the Holy Spirit to do that work that he has covenanted to do. Guide you into the truth of God's will. Guide you into the truth of God's uh, direction for your life. And he surely will. An answer to your prayer. But as we come to consider this in light of the local New Testament church, then whenever we are seeking to uh, make decisions which are crucial to our pleasing God, to our fulfilling the will of God in our generation, in our locality, and seeking to appoint men to positions within the church to fill rules of responsibility within the church, then we do well to seek the will of God. We do well to cast ourselves upon the word of God, even as the people did here. But this was not the only way that these rules were filled. 
It is an overriding principle, especially in areas of leadership, uh, that we, the people of God, always should seek the will of God. But there's other ways that rules can be filled. And indeed, as we come to this uh, story tonight, this account that's given to us in the days of Nehemiah, there's other ways that the rules were fulfilled. Let's notice verse 2. The Bible, the Bible says, All the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Now, when it came to the casting of the lot, I don't believe that that garnered as many numbers for them as this did in verse 2. And I believe that they saw the most fruit and the most fruitful way, uh, indeed, of filling the rules and indeed finding the people to fill those rules were found within those who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem to be engaged in the work of the Lord, to fulfill the rules and responsibilities that Nehemiah and the other leaders had highlighted as needing to be filled if God was to be pleased and His will was to be done amongst them. These were people who, were, who recognized the need and who came with a willing heart, surrendering all that they had, ready to be employed in the work of God in whatever rule was necessary. That's why the Bible tells us here that they willingly offered themselves. They didn't come with any preconditions or indeed preconceptions. They came willingly, identifying that there was a need, identifying there was many rules to be filled, and so they packed up their bags, they left where they called home, and they moved to their new home seeking to do what God would have them to do. The people who willingly offered themselves to the work of God. And friend, today I don't believe that there's anything that is more glorifying to God and indeed anything that is more prosperous to the work of the church than whenever rules are fulfilled and areas of work are filled by people who willingly give themselves to the work of God. That's not to say that people who are nominated or voted on are any lesser in any way. No, most certainly not. But genuine change is seen in the life of a believer whenever you're, you and I are willing to do anything and everything that God would have us to do in his service. When we come with a blank page in our hearts and we hand the pen to God and we say, God, You write upon my story whatever you see fit in this moment of my life. Now notice how this was identified even as that great moment by the people, for it tells us there that the people blessed all the men. They rejoiced in the fact that there was found amongst them willing servants who were ready, able, and indeed eager to get involved in the service of God eager to fill the rules that had been identified, eager to give up whatever was necessary in order that they might be of use in the service of the Lord. Tell me tonight, are you willing to come to the Lord? Are you willing to be as these people were in verse 2? Are you willing to say that there are many needs in my church and I'm not coming, picking and choosing what I will or I won't be involved in? I'm simply coming before you tonight, Lord, and saying wherever the need is, wherever the need is, help me to meet that need. Whatever the rule is, help me to fill that rule. Remember, your church needs you. Not only do we have the type of work that they were to be involved in, the way that the rules were fulfilled, but let us notice thirdly, The sort of people who did the work. The sort of people who did the work. Can we simply say this? Ordinary. Ordinary people are found noted upon this page of Scripture. There are names mentioned here, but we know nothing about these people. Some names are, of course, forever excluded. They are just labeled as the 822 that is faithfully served in the temple. Or indeed the 400, three score and eight valiant men who were ready to defend the city. But nevertheless, they all find themselves noted here upon the pages of Scripture forever. And I believe with all of my heart that these were just ordinary people who were willing to serve in ordinary ways. 
in order that God might do the extraordinary with their service. And that is in no way to belittle them. Rather, it is to compliment them. For they achieved the great without letting their egos get in the way. This book is full of names. It's full of lists. We've seen that as we've made our way through it. We've seen, of course, that some of these lists are positive. Those who are ascribed even the title of being faithful servants of God, willingly giving themselves to the service of God, strengthening their hands for the work and doing what they could to further and prosper the work. But there's also, of course, contained in this book, the lists of those who stood against God, stood against the work of God. And friend, tonight as we come to consider this list again in this chapter, another list that we see in this book and is here in chapter 11, it reminds us, does it not, that in heaven the business of recording lists is still ongoing. And I believe that those lists that are being recorded will one day be used whenever we all appear at the judgment seat of Christ before the marriage supper of the Lamb. And on that day, the list of willing servants of God who left their homes to travel to their new home in Jerusalem will be acknowledged. Those who oppose the work of God will be judged. But for the believer appearing at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not about our sin. For all of our sin, remember, has been dealt with, in Christ, with uh, by Christ at the cross as it was laid upon him. But rather, as we come to the judgment seat of Christ as a believer, it is, remember, to do with that which, which we shall be rewarded for and that which we shall suffer loss of reward for. Can you imagine being Yodia and Syntyche on that day? Two believers in the church at Philippi, but two believers who are recorded in Scripture at always being at all, each other's throats always being disruptive in the work of God. Can you imagine what it will be like for those two ladies that day to be called out in heaven as being those who opposed and were disruptive to the work of God? And as we come to consider the lists that are being compiled in heaven today, kid yourself not. For the Bible tells us clearly that heaven is recording all acts of faithfulness and indeed all acts of unfaithfulness. And on that day, the faithful toilet cleaners and weed pullers will be rewarded, but the disruptive members shall suffer loss of reward. Tell me tonight, which list do you appear on? The list of those who were faithful or the list of those who were disruptive? You see, these people here recorded for us in chapter 11 achieved the list of positive contribution by simply dying to themselves. And that's no surprise, is it? For you and I have already noted from last night's study that they consecrated themselves afresh to the service of God. That is, that they surrendered their all to Him. It was no longer about them. It was all about him. And they didn't care for one moment if their name was recorded or if it was found itemized on a list or if everybody knew it. They only desired, they only cared about fulfilling the will of God in their lives. And you and I may consider ourselves to be a person who is ordinary as we come to this study tonight. We may have no standout talents. We have may, may have achieved no major notoriety. But nothing makes you stand out more than just being willing. And as people like that, ordinary people who don't have those standout talents, who haven't achieved the major notoriety that the church needs today, that Christ is calling today, Ordinary men, ordinary women. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said in 1 Corinthians in the chapter 1 and the verse 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, 
How that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of this world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence." I know the Bible isn't saying that the noble are excluded or the gifted are excluded or the high and the mighty are excluded, not at all. But it is telling us here that not many of them are found faithful in the service of God. Why? Because God delights to use ordinary people. God has a special rule for ordinary people. He has called ordinary people to follow him. And he has that special place of or- for service for ordinary people just like you just like me. I wonder tonight, are you willing to come as a little boy did? Oh, it's my favorite story in all the Bible. But there he is and he's standing and he is hearing the Lord Jesus Christ. And upon that day, there's many thousands of people that are gathered around him hearing the words of the Savior. But of course, the day grows long and the bellies of the people begin to rumble. And there's that little lad and he has at his hand just that little meager packed lunch that his mother had provided for him that day. But he identified in that moment there was a need. And he identified in that moment that he had something, no matter how little it was, that could meet part of that need. And so he comes and hesitantly, no doubt, sheepishly, no doubt, extends that offer of just that small little lunch, five loaves and two fishes. I know he knew, even though he was a child, I have no doubt that he knew that what he gave that day was in no way sufficient to meet the needs of that crowd. But I believe also with all of my heart that he believed in Christ and in the ability of Christ to do what he could to meet that need. To do what only he could do to meet that need. And so he came and he extended that small amount of food and he placed it in the hands of the Almighty and standing there before that crowd, the Savior took that ordinary lunch and he did something extraordinary and he multiplied it. And he fed the thousands. And friend, tonight I identify so much with that story. For as I consider my own life, I remember the days of my childhood whenever I had a speech problem. And I identify those uh, things in my life that I've always been just average at. But oh, I remember that night in an unfinished building, church building in Poland. In January in 2008, when God got a grip of my heart and I was on my knees weeping tears before him and I said, Lord, I have very little to offer, but whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I'm willing. No, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm just an ordinary preacher. I'm not the finished article. I'm a below ordinary pastor. But I still desire for God to do something with this ordinary person. Something extraordinary. As he chooses to do. And friend, tonight as we gather, many of you who attend this church will... Remember the name Jim Bomber, a man that in the beginning of this year, we had the opportunity of leading to the Lord on his deathbed in hospital. But you know the truth about Jim Bomber, I'll tell you a secret. Because I had nothing really to do with the conversion of Jim Bomber. I knew it at that moment. But I was especially reminded of it just a few weeks later at his funeral. After he came to faith, 
He died and passed away, and it was at his funeral that a testimony of the preacher there reminded me of what I already knew. Because the reason that Jim Bammer came to know God was nothing to do with me. But it was all because an ordinary man, and I say that with the utmost of respect and love for this man, and many of you know him, but an ordinary man lived his ordinary life, and he lived it faithfully. And in doing so, God took that testimony and used it in an extraordinary way to bring Jim Balmer to salvation as he lay dying in a hospital. All glory to God. And I tell you tonight that that's who God is searching for in this church. That's who God is searching for in churches all across this land. He's looking for ordinary people who are willing to surrender their lives into the hands of an extraordinary God. During World War II, England needed to increase its production of coal. Winston Churchill called together those labor leaders who were required even to support this in order for it to become a reality. Many of these labor leaders were actually pushing for the coal miners to take a strike because of their lack of uh, conditions and proper pay. And at the end of his speech to them, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade which he had no doubt would be held one day in Piccadilly Circus as victory in the war would be celebrated by the nation. In that parade, he said, of course, would come the sailors, those who had have fought upon the seas to keep the sea lanes open and to keep the enemy at bay from the island of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk Then would come the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe from the skies. But last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in miners' caps. And oh, the boys and girls of the crowd would no doubt ask, and what were they doing during the days of the war? What was their level of service for our great country? And he said that from 10,000 throats would come the answer, We were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. They were the ordinary men. They were the ordinary women who served in ordinary ways but helped to achieve an extraordinary victory. Tonight, your church needs you Tell me, what are you willing to do for the work of God, for the house of God, for the witness of the gospel? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to give? Father, we thank and we praise thee for the call that goes out even from thy word. For we know, our God, that thou art one who seeks vessels through which thou canst accomplish great things. But they must be vessels fully yielded to thee. They must be emptied. They must be clean. And they must be willing to be filled and put to use wherever thou dost choose. God grant that we would be such vessels. God grant that I would be such a vessel. God grant that many, even within our fellowship here, would be such vessels. God grant that once again around our land there would be many vessels found through which God could do a mighty work and bring about a great victory in the lives of many who are yet outside of thee. 
Oh, Father, work within our hearts. Bring us to that position of being ready to surrender our all. And then, Lord, be pleased to take and to use us in whatever way thy dost see fit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This was so